Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 to 33. Let's read responsibly. Genesis 18, verses 16 to 33. And the men arose, sorry, and the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abram went with them to bring them on their on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that which thing I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence, and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city, Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are in them, that are therein, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Verse 26. And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom, Fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy all the city for the lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. Verse 30. And he said unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure, there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure, there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. Verse 32. And he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet. But this once, peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he, shall, and he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this morning, this privilege you give us to open your word and to allow our lives be brought under the preaching of your word. Father Lord, we thank you for the power in your word and the life that your word has. Truly, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from thy mouth. We need thee to speak to us. We need thee to minister your word to us. Lord, we need thee to, Lord, uh, enable us to be those that would confirm to the very word that you give to us, whereby, Lord, that uh, we might live out your word in your grace and in your enabling. Father, Lord, uh, this morning, unworthy as I am, unable in myself, Lord, uh, to exposit your word, I pray that you would hide me behind thy cross and that you would speak to me, through me, 
to each one of us, Lord, uh, that your word would have its full course. Lord, that you would speak with clarity and that you would, uh, Lord, uh, bless our lives to, Lord, not just receive but also treasure and also be great. Lord, be the ones that would have that become our portion. We thank you, we praise you. We submit this time into your loving hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I've titled my message um, this morning from this phrase in verse 25. The judge of the all earth does right. The, ju the judge of the all earth does right. And before I go into the sermon, um, I've been subscribed to a, a mailing list, uh, which is um, a prayer band, actually. Uh, it's called Indian Prayer Band. I mean, I didn't subscribe, they subscribed me. <laughs> they just added me. I think they looked up in the internet to find all the Indian church uh, circles and then added me. And uh, I keep getting these mails. We have a very concise email about making the news items uh, become prayer points. Uh, and they are very crisp and concise, uh, just like our uh, prayer team, as we have prayer updates going on, they send uh, weekly updates. And apart from that, there are also other sources uh, who, like uh, one, like ACLJ, who are always after fighting for the religious freedoms. Um, and those that are persecuted that uh, we get these updates from and I just would I just thought it might be appropriate for us to read uh, two of those reports and uh, this one from ACLJ it says Christians are disappearing in the cradle of Christianity raped enslaved beheaded chopped into pieces sold in the latest reports ISIS experiments with new execution methods of inhuman brutality, detonating bombs buried below men accused of apostasy. I mean, those men who are accused of apostasy are, apostasy are the ones that are being brutally, inhumanly executed. And then going forward, goes about to read, Christian women are sold as sex slaves. The younger the girls, the higher the price. The elderly men and young children are being beheaded because of their faith. And that's from ISIS, uh, that's from the ACLJ report. Um, there is, I said, the prayer band, uh, I think, I don't know the site, I forgot the site name, uh, but I think it might be Indian Prayer Band, a very good uh, concise prayer points that they send out and very anonymous. Nobody has any name on that site. They just are turning the new items to prayer requests. And uh, here uh, they say, pray for the persecuted Christians worldwide. May our persecuted brothers and sisters in the Lord come out from the shadow of death to the shadow of life. We pray for their victory over the evil one, that they would carry the flag of the cross to the top of the highest mountains. The more they are persecuted, the more they may grow in the Lord. And then pray for the persecutors. We pray that the Lord would open their eyes and hearts to the way, the truth, and the life. We pray that through witnessing Christ in the lives of those they are persecuting, they too may come to know the Lord. We pray the Lord would change their hearts as he changed Saul to Paul. And then lastly, Pray that God would use the persecuted church to open the hearts of people in the supreme sacrifice of Jesus for the world. We pray that the voice of the persecuted church would touch the hearts of the secular and bring them to Jesus Christ. So uh, as I read these prayer points and as I read these rep reports that are there, it, is, um, it can get disheartening, it can get discouraging. It can be um, so dulling our lives that there is no God. Uh, I mean, not to say that we 
uh, would think so, but many in the secular world would, taking these news reports would say, is, if God is there, why would such things happen? And uh, often the excuse given by people uh, in not believing God is most often is the human suffering. But uh, we as children of God would also have a disheartening time. When would God uh, take uh, to judge and to undertake for those that are being persecuted, especially if we are on the receiving side, if we are in the forefront of being brought under that brutality? So when we come to these questions, we always, as we look to the scripture, we find uh, such compelling answers and then compelling um, responses that people of God have uh, that would challenge us, that would uh, encourage us in our faith. And so is it in today's portion, as we, will, uh, as we will continue in this book of Genesis chapter 18, we looked last week in the first 15 verses where I would sum it up in this way. It says, the Lord visits Abraham with the promise. In the first 16 verses, 15 verses, we saw how the Lord visited Abraham with promise. As the Lord visited Abraham, we saw his humble and uh, hospitable receiving and uh, his serving and uh, how he desired uh, to take care of, uh, of the Lord who was visiting him in the sense that he came to give him a promise to assure of him. And uh, very interesting as we looked at when Abraham and Sarah were brought to the end of their lives, meaning that there is no more uh, hope in of their own strength to receive what the promise of God has to, that is when the Lord visits. Often we have to put an end to our own strength at times. That doesn't mean we just don't do anything, but then God would w have us consider that it is all his doing and that he is to duly be glorified. And so as I sum up the first 15 verses, I wouldn't go uh, much into it, but the whole chapter hangs on these two profound rhetorical questions. If you would take note, in chapter 18 verses 14 we see, is anything too hard for the Lord? This is one rhetorical question. The obvious answer is, no, there is nothing too hard for the Lord. And there is this second question that is also rhetorical where it says, shall not the judge of the all earth do right? Yes, he will. And that is, those are the two rhetorical questions that are about the Lord that would, that this whole chapter hangs on. And uh, we see, we saw the first portion that it is, there is nothing too hard for the Lord and the Lord is the one who brings Abraham and Sarah to their end of their strength to only prove that when it becomes impossible, God is the only one who can make it possible to duly be glorified and honored, uh, to fulfill the promises that he promised and to do things that are not possible in our own strength. So as we look at chapter 16, verses, uh, chapter 18, verses 16 to 33, I've titled this, uh, uh, this portion just so that you can easily remember if the first 15 verses were the Lord visits Abraham with promise then this the last uh, section that is 16 to 33 they give to us the Lord reveals to Abraham a plan the Lord reveals to Abraham a plan um, so although we might be able to easily uh, subtitle them that way my title for the sermon today is that the judge of the all earth will and shall do right, shall do right. Let's uh, go about. So as we come to verse 16, we read, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. Who are these men? These are the same three men that Abraham have received in verse 2. And he looked up his eyes and looked, and lo, Three men stood by, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them and from the tent door and bowed himself toward the Lord. And we see that uh, as he is seeing them off, he does that 
good hostly gesture of being able to walk them. And probably this is not just to the doorstep like how we do, try to just uh, as little as possible try to see them off. He went, uh, the commentators would say he went three miles. I wish <laughs> we would go to somebody's house as well <laughs> in this time in the, in, in the place. But he went almost like three miles uh, to see them off just so that he can't go further beyond and uh, as they were approaching to uh, Sodom. And so that's how far he goes, a very good hostly gesture that Abraham does. And so Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. And in verse 17, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Now, this is quite true why Abraham might have done that way. It is like if I were to come, maybe you'll just come to the doorstep. If say President Obama comes, to visit your house. How would, you how would you send him off? Would you just come to your doorstep and say bye? You would try to go to the airport and say, as much as possible that you can go far, you try to go. And that is what Abraham recognizes. He is no small guest. He is the God of the universe who has appeared unto me. He has come to reiterate his promise. And as he had said, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the Lord's promise was being established there. And so he goes as far as possible to see him off. And here in verse 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation. So just to bring up uh, clarity in verses 16 and 17, Abraham is seeing them off. And it is at that time the Lord begins to consider for revelation, consider Abraham for revelation, consideration for revelation. We see that in verses 18 and 19. There are two reasons why is God considering to reveal things to Abraham. We see that as two reasons given in verses 18 and 19. That is, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And verse 19, the second reason, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. See, the one who is about to consider Abraham, give a consideration for revelation, is the one who knows what he is going to bring to pass in the life of Abraham. He knows the future and uh, he knows the heart of Abraham. He knows how Abraham would respond and how God is going to use Abraham in the covenantal knowing that he had come. He has come to know him intimately. He has been brought into this covenantal relationship and that's why we see that God is for sure going to bring to pass all that he has promised and he sees the heart of Abraham responding to the work of God in duly raising up his children in a godly manner. Here we, we read in verses 18 that that is about primarily the blessing that God has chosen Abraham to be. God has not chosen Abraham to be just blessed, but to be a blessing onto the many nations. It is this person that he has chosen from a pagan background to bless all nations, all families in the earth. As we, re as we read in Genesis chapter 12 verse 3, that it pleased God to make a covenantal relationship with one man through whom he can bring a nation, through whom he can bring salvation, and that all the nations of the earth would be brought under that blessing. And so that's what we see here in what God knows in his blessings that are to come forward upon Abraham. And not only that, he would pass on that blessing. He would pass on that, uh, that life of, of godliness unto his children. He will command his children and his household after him that they shall keep the way of the Lord. You know, when we come to talking about our lives before our children, it is not easy that they would become the children that we would want to be the moment we command. I wish all our children are like that. I mean, you command and they're able to do it uh, with all uh, love and affection. But that's not the reality. I think before even he could go about to command, he should have modeled 
of how he submitted to his God and to the commands of his God. And there we see that there is a need for our lives to be modeled before them, before we command them. And so certainly Abraham had that uh, in such a way that he himself brought his life under the command of God to be obedient to God. Faith, a, a great man of faith with exemplary faith of due obedience that we would see him follow through. And so our lives as we so desire our children to be brought up in a godly way, we see that a lack often is with regards to the lack of modeling that before them, before we command them. We are so quick into commanding before modeling them as to what it is to be a godly, godly people or a godly parents unto them. And so we see that God sees it through that Abraham would command his children, that is, he would model to his children and then he would command his children that his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. If you and I are not to do what is just and what is righteous, there is no way that our children would pick up. There is no way that if we are not living a life of righteousness that God has called us to, that our children would live and love righteousness. And so we see that in the life of Abraham. Moving forward, we see after God, uh, after the scripture gives us the consideration for revelation, it also gives us the information of revelation. That is the what aspect. And the Lord said, verse 20, we read, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down I'll go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it and which is come unto me and if not I will know. Here we see the what of revelation is being revealed, the plan, the details of what is being revealed. Now we might be wondering, doesn't the Lord know where their hearts are? Why does the, the Lord has to come down to see and to know? As though he doesn't know, he says here and the Lord said, that he would go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. And so it, it, it brings us to question his omniscience, but, but the fact here is that before we come to answer that, let me help us to see an important aspect in verse 20. The, the cause for Sodom to be judged is that their sin is very grievous. The sin, their sin is very grievous. You know, many a times, uh, and also, apart from that, the second one is their cry is great. Their sin is grievous, their cry is great. You know, that gives us a glimpse of what sin is. Sin is harmful to our soul and our lives. God has never intended and designed sin to be part of our lives. God is not the author of sin. God is not the author of evil. We see the root of all evil, as Jesus puts it in Mark 7, 21, is the heart of man. And it is this sin that destroys him utterly. And before it can destroy him utterly, there is a cry of pain that comes out of, a, out of, the, out of the stench of sin that is there. You know, Sometimes we don't see this way, but the wages of sin, as the scripture defines it, is death. And often we don't relate sin to stench. Stench is exactly when you and I are in a house which has a dead body. That is exactly what stench is. It is a smell that is unbearable. And that is what is the result of sin. And so, so grievous is sin that it is unbearable that they would destroy themselves in sin, that their cry is so great that the Lord would want to deal with them, judge them before they destroy themselves even more and to, and to lead them to the, to the suffering that they would uh, harm themselves upon by, by the sin that they are into. We see that in detail as we go to chapter 19. We will see how, how far they have gone how wild they have become in the wild affections that they have built themselves up. And so God has come to judge them 
before they destroy themselves in their sin, even to pain themselves and, and uh, cry out with the cry that is up here. And so as we see this fact in the, in the information of the revelation as to what God is about to, God is about to visit Sodom in the cry of Sodom that is great, in the sin that is grievous, God is going down to see. You know, the reason that God goes down, we see that in a similar way in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, as the same author goes about to record in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and, the, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In verse 6 it says, It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Excuse me. And it grieved him at his heart. And so when we take a look at it, we see that God would, would be patient enough till their sin comes up to such a level where they would destroy themselves. We see that patience of God even in Genesis chapter 15 where with regards to the Amorites, the sin of Amorites in Genesis chapter 15 verse 16 we read that Abraham was not yet to possess the promised land but that it would be after four generations. And why was it so that the promised land is not going to be delivered from Amorites and given to the children of Israelites? It is because in verse 16, Genesis 15 we read, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It is not yet full. You know, God, although knows the very depth of their sin and the, and the, and the heart of uh, the wickedness that they have, He just would want to be patient enough so that they haven't come to an extent where their iniquity is full or it has peaked to such a maximum level that he has to destroy them or judge them in his holiness. And so when we look at how God is going down, he is wanting to see the grievousness of sin in his own sight so that before he judges them in destruction with the hail fire that would be poured down, he sees the reality of their suffering in their sin. And so he is very patient in dealing with judgment and he is long suffering when it comes to destroying us in our sin. And so here we see that Sodom and Gomorrah as, as the Lord gives the details or the information of Revelation in verses 20, 21, we see in verse 22, and the men turned their faces from thence and went to the, towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Who are these men? We see that in 19 chapter verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom. We see by this, uh, and also from Genesis 18 verse 22, that of the three men that came, two of them have moved on towards Sodom, but one of them remains. And as we read verse 23, we read, And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Actually, in verse 22, the last portion, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. We now understand that of the three men, there was Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, and also the two angels that came around. And uh, we see that they moved on to Sodom, but the Lord stayed with Abraham as he began to converse. So verses 23 to 33 is a glimpse of the reaction of the revelation. If God were to give, God was giving the consideration for revelation, verse 17, verses 18 to 21, the information of the revelation, verses 23 to 33, we see, 32, we see the reaction of revelation. And we might think the reaction as a word that is used negatively, but reaction simply is what is the response of Abraham to the revelation that God has given. God reveals his plan about how he's come down to go to Sodom and to see their sin and the grievousness of it and to judge them. And the heart of Abraham is seen here in his reaction or his response as we see from verses 23 to verses 32. If there is 
one thing that is of great concern to Abraham in his response, it is highlighted in the central question that he puts it in verses 24, where he says, be it far from thee to do after this manner, after which manner? The judge of the whole earth would destroy the wicked along with the righteous. And the concern that we see is that Abraham is concerned about Abraham is concerned about Lord's judgment and justice. He's concerned about if God would do that. And yes, sovereignly he could do whatever it pleases him. But by very core of his nature, we see our God is a just God, our God is a righteous God. And he is not a God who would destroy the, wick, the righteous and the wicked together. And uh, so he goes about to begin an intercession as we see the great intercession um, in, in the reaction of revelation, Abraham begins his great intercession. You know, when we take a look at Abraham's intercession, he goes one by one in the way he is coming to the great and the most high God, yet with humility and with great perseverance. He goes after pleading with God to somehow spare the city where his dear Lot and his family are there. He knew that and with his heart burdened for them, he goes about to do the intercession. We see from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10, he is constantly after the Lord to not, to not withdraw until the Lord hearkens unto his cry and that he would spare this city. You know, God was always with Abraham in saying exactly what Abraham was pleading. We see that when we come to this portion, does God change his mind if he had already th uh, decided or if he had already chosen to destroy? Would our intercession matter? Would our pleading uh, really be of any significance? God is anyway going to do his will, so why pray is a usual question that we would always come with as excuse, not really of a concern that we would have. But we see here that Abraham was persistent. He was constantly pleading, continually pleading, as we see, till to the, to, till to the end of his intercession as we come to in verse 32. And so, of all this, we see that his, his, uh, his, his question that he puts as a rhetorical question in verse 25, we see, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? You know, the answer, of course, as I've said, is yes. But in what way? In what way does he do, uh, in what way does he do things right? Does he look uh, just for the things that are happening and people that are growing in sin and rebellion to him and not do anything and we just hope beyond hope and see and say that God will somehow take care of it. If there is a, a newborn baby who is, uh, who is being brutally killed in the, in the news today and when we look to the, the, when we look to the things that have happened in the descriptions that are given, it would, it would seem so that God is not truly the one who would make all things right. But we see that in and through this very chapter uh, or this section of the scripture that we are seeing, that we see that God will do it right as he has done it right in the past, as he is doing it right to the extent that we may not be able to fully reconcile, but in his own sovereignty, he is doing it right. And far more than anything, he is the only one, and his existence is the only answer whereby all rights would be made, all wrongs would be made right at some point. If, if there is no God, and if there is no judgment, and if there is no hope beyond the grave, there is no means whereby all wrongs would be made right at some day or the other. And so when we come to this 
portion we see right in this section the judge of the earth does it right he does it right in revealing we see that in verses 17 onwards he considers to reveal to abraham he did it right in revealing it to abraham you know if not for the plan that god had to abraham and the promises all the earth would have perished and yet he reveals his plan and he gives his promises to do it right when man rebelled in the garden of eden god would have chosen to destroy him utterly and make an end to himself when man rebelled in genesis 6 when his heart was filled with wickedness he could have destroyed the whole earth utterly and would have done it right completely there but he is patient enough to choose abraham and to bring out his plans and promises and as he reveals his promises and his plans here even with the minute detail of the judgment that is coming upon one nation called sodom and gomorrah we see that he reveals it to abraham who is given a promise to bless all nations of the earth and that is how meticulous god is in dealing to do right what is wrong and so he is revealing to abraham and he is right in revealing he is right in making his people respond you know why does god reveal this to abraham he revealed it that he would become the intercessor that he became he revealed it that he would become the the persistent intercessor that he became in the next few verses that we see today god reveals his plans in his scripture to us not just that we just uh, boast about knowing things that are to come but that we be the intercessors just like abraham when we know things about the impending judgment when we know things about the wrath of god that is coming upon the fellow workers that we work with our colleagues that we work with our dear ones our family members we would intercede we would stand in the gap we would make a difference we would plead to the core and ask the lord lord would you not do a new work in their hearts would you not have fresh visit them would you not spare them and that's what we see in the life of abraham and so coming to close here we see god the judge of the earth is right in making his people reflect his character you know one thing that stands so strong as we read through this particular scripture is that god could see his own heart in the life of this covenant person that he has he has chosen he sees the reflection of his heart god's heart is never to destroy the righteous with the wicked in fact he doesn't even delight in destroying the wicked we read that in ezekiel chapter 18 verses 1 onwards as the children of israel have got it wrong when they say that the father's sins are coming upon the sons and they are being destroyed god says that leave those father's sins coming upon children i don't delight even in the perishing and the death of the wicked ezekiel chapter 18 verse 18 we read as for his father let's let's let me read verse um 21 but if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right he shall surely live he shall not die and in verse 23 we see have i any pleasure at all that the wicked should die said the lord and not that he should return from his ways and live that is the kind of god that we have we have a god who does things right and he does things right by making his people become intercessors and also making his people reflect his character he is right in making his people reflect his character and finally he is right in judging you know after all this we might think that it is only about our prayer our intercession it is only about our reflection of god's character but we see although we might think that as ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 puts it that because the judgment is slow in coming men are growing in wickedness we might also come under that assumption 
but we see that there is a day that is coming where God is going to bring all things under judgment. Um, in Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 we see the picture, uh, let me come in backwards. There are three ways, three ways that God does what was wrong and he makes it right. The first is he does what is wrong in making it right in, in future. That is, in Revelation 20 verse 11, we read that he is going to bring all things to judgment. Books will be opened and things and the dead will be given in the white throne judgment. And he is going to square even all the ones that have lived out wickedly, whether it be kings or, or the small ones. We see in Revelation 20 verse 11, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled and there was found no place for them and when, and I saw verse 12 small and great stood before God and the books were opened and the other book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of the things of those things which were written in the books according to their works there is no one would, who would be escaped but all would stand under the judge of the earth who would do right all that was wrong and this is the future hope that has been recorded for us in scripture. And not just that, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 24 we read that there are some sins that are being judged today by the authority that God has placed upon mankind. He's bringing some things, some sins to light and he's bringing them to judgment. But having said that, it is not true that all have been dealt with in 1st Timothy chapter 5 verse 24 we read some men's sins are open beforehand going before to the judgment and some men they follow after some men they follow after and so there is everything whether it be thoughts deeds and actions all brought under the scrutiny and that would be judged and so there is this present judgment that God is doing and also the future that he has already recorded it in the scripture. But having said that, there is also one judgment that has happened already, that has happened in the past. Here Abraham looks forward for what is coming up in the judgment of Sodom that we have seen, in, uh, that we will see in chapter 19. But there is a judgment for our lives uh, in, that has happened in the past as we see in Isaiah chapter 53, in verse 10 we read that Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse, tw verse 11 He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. And for, for he shall bear their iniquities. And uh, actually in verse 12 we read, He shall be numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Here we see that our Lord Jesus Christ, he took your place and mine in the wrath of God that was to fall upon you and me. And that was where the judgment has happened already for the sins that were done in your life and mine and there as we bring ourselves under the covering of that blood as we bring ourselves under the atoning work of our Lord Jesus Christ our sins our condemnation has been dealt with and to, to those of whom that judgment ha that, that have passed from judgment to life we have this privilege to be his children, to be his people who would reflect his character just like how Abraham had reflected. You know, I'll close with this illustration. When the silversmith begins to work, as he does this work of trying to mold and shape the, shape the, um, shape the ornament that he is making, or, the, or if it is a basin or something, if he is shaping it in the accordance to the shape that he desires, and he polishes it. And the kind of polishing that he does is, he finishes it only when he sees his face, 
being reflected so perfectly in that instrument that he is making. And so God desires us that we as his children would reflect his heart, reflect his character. And so may it be so that we would recognize that he is making us to be the intercessors. He is making us those that would reflect his heart. And may we grow in, in the heart that our Lord Jesus had himself, who was moved with compassion as he saw many that are perishing. And so as we continue, we will look at how God has truly judged even Sodom in delivering Lot, the righteous, by his grace and not bringing him to the judgment that he was bringing upon Sodom and the wickedness that was in it. So let's close in prayer and ask the Lord for his blessing. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for this privilege you give us to open your word and allow our lives be open to the, to the life that is in your word. Lord, there is nothing that is good in us whereby you loved us, but it pleased thee, Lord, to make us a new creation, to make us a covenant people, to bring us to not just be blessed, but be a blessing. Yes, Lord, when we were filled with stench of sin, the death that was upon us, Lord, your Son came and bore that wrath for us on the cross. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your great grace. And having received such a grace, and having been set free from the captivity of sin, Lord, having been passed from judgment to life, May it be so that we would be people that would reflect your heart. Lord, that would be the intercessors that would stand in the gap, that would plead persistently, that would desire towards our end as well, dear Father, that we would desire for the salvation of the many that are so desperately needing to receive your forgiveness. Father, give us grace. We pray for those that are yet to give their hearts to you, that they might come to recognizing the stench of sin and that you would deliver them from themselves to be brought into this new life that is in Christ Jesus. We ask for your blessing upon the rest of the day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, communion of Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us both now and forevermore.